When I lived in Evanston, Illinois, I was working as a campus ministry with uh, University Christian Ministries at Northwestern University. I lived with a group of students in a ministry house called Fisher Folk. I was also part of a group called the Covenant Community. Our, our covenant was a shared commitment to doing inclusive worship and to make justice happen together in the Chicago area. One morning, Howard showed up at Fisher Folk and knocked on the door. Howard was in our orbit of concern. I say orbit because Howard was homeless, and he spent a large part of his time traveling by bus between Evanston and Ann Arbor, Michigan. I guess that traveling gave him a, a rhythm and a pattern to his life. And in each of those places, he had ministries and agencies that provided him sustenance and made sure he had his medications and gave him good care. Hey, Howard, good to see you. How, how, how are you doing? I said, Howard shook his head and he pointed to a, a writing tablet he carried. I read it and it said, I'm not able to talk right now. Oh, I said, are you sick? He, he shook his head and he wrote, if I talk, the demons might find me. Well, I brought him in and it went like that back and forth. Me asking him, him writing on his pad. And finally, I learned that he needed to eat and to get bus fare back to Ann Arbor. So we fed Howard and sent him on his way, expecting to see him back in a few days. There was also Tom, who one day came by and invited me to go for a walk with him around the campus. We came to this particular busy intersection. It was a place where the students coming out of the parking lot would go into a pretty frantic flow of traffic on Lakeshore Boulevard. Tom stood there and he announced, now this is the devil's corner. And he wouldn't cross until I prayed with him and asked Jesus to come and help us cross safely. So I did. And now when the traffic slowed, we went across with Tom holding my hand. So back at Fisher Folk, I wondered what I had witnessed. The words devils and demons had dropped out of my vocabulary. They'd been replaced by words like paranoid, schizophrenia, things like that. But here they were resurfacing again as realities for guys like Howard and Tom, and I expect so many others. I'd like to think that Tom and Howard were in our orbit of concern because somehow they were experiencing incarnate love in that community. Or perhaps it was God's incarnate love shining through us, even through their traumatized psyches. I'd also like to think that I remembered these stories of Howard and Tom because of this story. Luke's version of a story that appears in the big three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, where incarnate love in the person of Jesus meets trauma incarnate. A story where incarnations of love and trauma collide is going to be complex. And I have looked at this story through my life again and again, and I've listened to some very fine sermons and lessons about crossing the boundaries of race and prejudice, the boundary between the rich and the poor, like, like Jesus does in this story, to reach people with the gospel. Or how, how the church is called to 
a ministry of presence with those who are afflicted with moral injury or any form of mental illness, or, or sermons that lament the times when a church like this community in the story will turn its back on Christ's work there because it's afraid of the consequences. But recently, though, I've been seeing how other work this story is doing. Maybe it's because of the war in the Ukraine. Maybe it's because of the epidemic of gun violence that we're seeing on a regular basis these days. Maybe it's because of resurgent white supremacy. I'm beginning to say how this story addresses what life is like in our empire when it convulses. So, the story begins with a man whose misery is so unbearable that he retreats to live among the untroubled dead. His agony is so intense that he smashes himself with rocks, maybe as a distraction from the psychic pain he's enduring. And Luke seems to indicate that a Roman military unit called a legion is stationed nearby, and fresh in the collective memory of those garrisons is a massacre. During the First Jewish War, the Roman general Lucius Annius put at least 1,000 rebels to death and destroyed their towns and villages all around in the region of the garrisons. And the Gospel writer names this man Legion. That was a clue to the Jewish listeners to this story to associate this man's madness with the presence of that imperial army nearby, which was primed for violence at any moment. Maybe this man has been a victim of moral injury a witness to the worst of that violence. Maybe members of his family were among those who were massacred. Or maybe he's become, what we might say, the toxic handler of the effects of Rome's brutal oppression and exploitation of this colony. Whatever the case, the story presents him as out of his mind. Enter the power of God in the person of Jesus. Luke's testimony is that God's power turns things upside down and inside out. Now, it's the demons who are afraid. Afraid enough to give their power to decide their fate over to Jesus. <laughs> and Jesus seems to have compassion even for the demons in that he gives them what they ask for. Rather than go back to the abyss where they came from, seems to be a place too scary even for the demons, they prefer another fate. Going into the bodies of pigs and then plunging down the hillside and drowning in the sea. In that way, according to Jewish mythology, they were returned to a place where the demons could continue to make trouble. Now, this is not a story for the Midwestern pig farmer. It's a story for a Jewish audience who considered pigs to be unclean animals. Now, I could give you a moment to, to think in our context what animals are unclean to you and allow you to substitute those animals for these pigs, and you can get some sense of why this is a story of great triumph that Jesus accomplishes over the evil represented by the demons. Demons, pigs, unclean animals, all gone. Right? You'd think that everybody would celebrate that, but no. Not everybody is happy about it. 
Instead of being happy about a man restored to his right mind, they are angry about pigs. A vote is taken, 99 to 1, Jesus must leave. And we're left with a story of a community that's back in bondage to fear. This is what I think the story does. It shows what happens when God's love is allowed to come into any community that is in the grip of fear. Fear is complicated. It doesn't come from just any one place. It comes from many places. And when it comes, it takes prisoners. It causes relationships to break. It clouds the future. It stunts growth. But its power is limited. God's love, represented in this story by Jesus, keeps working and working until someone, anyone, everyone is in their right mind. But lately I've seen how this ancient story might be doing something else. It holds up a mirror to the cracked world we lived in. I watched a podcast the other day by Russell Moore, who is now working with Christianity Today in a public theology project, and he's been called as an evangelical dissident. And now he was interviewing in this podcast the man who called him that, David Brooks, the columnist for the New York Times. Here's the first question Moore put to Brooks. Are the times really as crazy as they seem? Or is this just life? Oh, it's beyond dispute, Brooks answered. Then he went on to recite those terrible statistics that we're all too familiar with, the, incre the increasing rates of depression, the incidences of gun violence, suicide, an epidemic of opioids and other substance abuse, despair. Why? Why is this so? Then Brooks began to quote some of the things he'd heard from people. No one knows me well, one person told him. I don't have any close friends, said another. It's a case of Moral loneliness, Brooks said. Now, I, I've never heard those two words put together like that. Moral and loneliness? Is that what's driving us crazy? Is that why we have rejected the love of neighbor, God, and country and have turned to a politics of hate? Because it's easier to say, I'm good but my opponents are evil, then it is to confess, I'm lonely, I'm hurting, I need the love of God and neighbor. This, I think, is a story of how the practice of persistent incarnate love for God, neighbor, and country can restore us to our right minds. But it's also a sad story about how a community voted against incarnate love and returned to its bondage to fear. A man restored to his right mind by God's grace and incarnate love remained in that community to tell his story. What will your story be?